Hello, I'm Sophie Ikenye. Welcome to Focus on Africa, our top stories. A new president for Algeria after two decades, but protesters say Abdel Majin Tebboune is too wedded to the old regime. I came out today because these elections do not have political, popular or constitutional legitimacy. A majority win for the UK's Conservative Party. What does it mean for Africa and the African diaspora? Also in the program, below ground, above board. A new diamond rush in South Africa as the government makes artisanal mining legal. And in sports, Springboks captain Sia Kolisi says he wants to avoid the pitfalls of fame and fortune. Thanks for joining us on Focus on Africa from BBC World News. Algeria has a new president, Abdel Majid Tebboune, who is a former prime minister, took just over 58% of the vote in an election that's been marked by a low turnout and months of mass protests. Demonstrators say that the elections were neither free nor fair, as all five candidates had close links with former president Abdelaziz Bouteflika. He was forced to resign in April after two decades in power. Rachid Sekai sent us this report from Algiers. Today is Friday, the day protesters gather in big cities across Algeria in what's become known as the Hirak or popular uprising. The protests have been going on since last February. Just kilometers away from here, in the center of Algiers, massive demonstrations opposed to the holding of this very election are taking place. To Bune does not represent us, neither do the other four candidates. Our media does not represent us because they do not listen to our voices. I'm a young man and they've never listened to me. We said no to elections with the gang and all of those who were part of the Bouteflika regime had to leave. We do not agree with what is happening. As the youth, our future is destroyed. We are jobless. Personally, I do not agree with this election. It is clear to everyone that it is 100% rigged. I completely disagree with it. I came out today because these elections do not have political, popular or constitutional legitimacy. People aren't stupid. We will keep protesting until they realise all of our demands. We're fed up with this injustice. We want it to stop. President Taboon said during his campaign that he is committed to change. Protesters have long demanded a radical change of power. Algeria is rich in resources and remains an important player in the Arab world and for its European neighbours who have interest in Algeria and with Algeria. So how will the new Algerian president reassure these protesting crowds on one hand and his Arab and European nations on the other that he can deliver the change they want? Well, with me in studio is the BBC's Amira Mohadbi. Thank you for taking time to talk to us on Focus exactly. on Africa. The turnout was 40%. Mm -hmm. But I wonder whether the Electoral Com Commission has said anything at all about, you know, the ballots that were destroyed in some parts of the country. No, actually they praised the turnout, the, what they call the high turnout, which is in fact was the lowest in um, Algeria's history. But maybe because of the protests, and they've been going for weeks and weeks, tens of thousands and maybe millions, were protesting against these elections. The commission itself and the interim government itself didn't expect people to turn out. So 40%, or actually it is not even 40, it's 39.83% is a big turnout for the, for the commission. Considering the protests. Exactly, they, they, they weren't expecting that maybe. Okay, and uh, Mr. Bouteflika, since Mr. Bouteflika left office, there have been a number of uh, high profile arrests. Yes. I wonder why this has not really pacified the protesters it's not because basically there is a lack of trust from the protesters in the government, in the interim government. Not even arrests, not just arrests, but last week we had trials of ex-prime ministers uh, Ouyahia and Selel and a number of high-ranking um, officials as well. But people don't really trust the government, the interim government. They think and they believe that this was just a political move and after the elections, after 
the government gaining its goal or getting to its goal, these leaders will be out. And they're comparing this to what happened in Egypt with uh, Hosni Mubarak. He's outside jail now. So they basically don't trust the government. Mm. So then what happens? Because the protests have been going on for many months now yes. and nothing seems to be moving. What happens if nothing happens? That's the next step then. So uh, basically we saw um, protests today, huge protests. Now the problem is that the protesters, when, when the protests started months ago, they were shouting the same uh, slogans. Mm -hmm. But then when they declared the election, when the interim um, president declared elections, we had two campaigns. We had pro-elections and against elections. Now we have more divisions inside the protesters because now we have against elections and we have pro-elections but against Tabun with others. So we don't really expect though the government has to deal with it mm -hmm. in two different uh, possible scenarios, let's say. The first one is to find an alternative for, the, for this president or for these elections, which we, we don't really believe is going to happen. The second thing is just to end this and we might then be going to oppression, we might be going to violence and people are recalling already the scenarios of the 90s, mm. which no one will, we want to get there. So there is concern about the stability exactly. of the country. I wonder though how much a pressure uh, this current president, the one who's just been elected, will be under from the international community, because uh, Abdi just mentioned there that there's, there is pressure from outside and of course pressure uh, from uh, his backyard. Exactly. Um, there is also pressure from inside because now those who voted for him and those who were pro-election but didn't actually vote for him and those who were neutral basically and even those from outside Algeria, they expect him to do something to calm down the streets, to move forward, because we all know that he is part of the old regime. Four, five of them, five of the um, candidates were part of the old regime, but Tabun was an ex-prime minister. He was a minister since 91. He's maybe the, the closest to the, to the previous regime. So now he has to convince people that there is a change happening and he's the man that will make this change. He will, he will also have to convince the international forces who are already we started um, seeing calls from French minister um, Emmanuel Macron to um, Tabun to deal with the protesters in a very civilized way, <laughs> let's say. So this is the other challenge, how he will end this situation in the most civilized and peaceful way possible. All right, Amira Mhadbi, thank you for your thoughts. Thank, thank you, you. Sophie. Yes. Let's now take a quick look at other stories making headlines across Africa and the rest of the world. A high court in South Africa has delivered a landmark ruling that the children of undocumented immigrants must be allowed access to education regardless of their legal status in the country. But the ruling also means that the children of South Africans without birth certificates or identity documents also cannot be denied education, which has been the practice in some schools across the country. Now Zimbabwe's first lady, Auxilia Mnangagwa, has asked traders to lower prices of food and basic commodities, and that's according to the state-owned Herald newspaper. An ongoing drought, high fuel costs, and severe inflation means around half of all Zimbabweans are facing hunger. Now, it's uh, the last day of the summit in Madrid that sought to set goals to tackle climate change. But where does Africa stand in these negotiations? As a very small polluter, Africa is also industrializing and urbanizing quickly. So how do you strike a balance between economic growth and avoiding carbon emissions? Pierre-Antoine Denis reports from Madrid. A whole continent facing a dilemma. How can Africa develop, industrialize and grow without compromising global efforts to tackle global warming? This is the major debate for African countries here at COP25. One thing is certain at the moment, Africa is not responsible for the current global warming, but its choices in the coming years, especially in terms of agriculture and energy, could have a major impact on the climate crisis. The world should not be asking Africa to make sacrifices. Um, the world should be helping Africa to deal with climate change better, the climate change impacts which by and large African countries did not cause but which they will disproportionately feel the impacts of. But nevertheless, I think Af we are seeing African countries step up in a, in a responsible way and we're seeing a lot of creativity and leadership in the way that countries are, are implementing those actions. And creativity has been needed since 2015, when each country that signed the Paris Agreement had to submit national pledges to the United Nations for national contributions to the global effort. These NDCs, which must be increased next year, can be seen as a burden on the continent. In the next 30 years, half of the world's growth is expected 
to be African. But this growth would inevitably be compromised by carbon emission constraints, such as in Dakar, Cairo or Lagos, where the air may soon become unbreathable. These are also cities that are rapidly growing, so they are expanding. So in those spaces where they are expanding, this is where we need to invest in the right technology, whether it's the right infrastructure for transportation, the right infrastructure for housing, for public spaces. It is a whole continent that has something to offer and a big role to play. So for the development banks, the only thing now is to raise awareness and broaden the strategies. The challenges that comes with uh, climate change is not only the negatives, it's also the positives in terms of, of thinking about the potential new markets. So there's a different way of thinking that you have to be, uh, to be looking at. With us sitting in South Africa dependent on coal for, 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 for power, what happens to those markets that you are exporting to when they start responding to the Paris Agreement? It would mean that what you used to depend on in terms of exports dries out. Whatever happens at this COP25 and in the following editions, Africa is today at a crossroads in the urgency to make choices to grow in the most eco-friendly way possible. A task that is obviously very complicated since no one in the world has ever done it before. Pierre-Antoine Denis, BBC News. Madrid. Well, as we heard earlier, Algeria is starting a new political chapter with Abdel Majid Taboun at the helm, and so too is the UK, where Boris Johnson's Conservative Party has won its biggest parliamentary majority in more than 30 years. Now, um, uh, the Prime Minister called his party's win an ex extraordinary and vowed to bring closure to the Brexit debate of exactly how the UK leaves the EU, which has paralyzed much of the UK politics for a number of years now. Most of Mr Johnson's success came at the expense of Labour, the opposition party. Its leader, Jeremy Corbyn, has said he will stand down once his successor has been elected. Well, the relationship between the UK and various African countries appears important because some leaders took to the social media to give their thoughts. In a tweet, Zambian President Edgar Lungu expressed confidence that Zambia and the UK will continue to explore avenues of cooperation and investment under Mr. Johnson's leadership. Somalia's President Mohamed Farmajo said the UK is a valuable ally and friend of Somalia. Kenya's Uhuru Kenyatta congratulated Mr. Johnson and promised to work to strengthen bilateral ties. While President of Nigeria, Mohamed Buhari, said he looks forward to working with the, the Prime Minister to forge a stronger Nigeria-UK relationship. Well, I'm now joined by Abdi Muse, an activist from the Friends of the Horn Foundation. That's an organization that helps the Somali diaspora in the UK. Thanks for taking time to talk to us on Focus on Africa. What's your reaction to this result? Thank you for having me, first of all. And secondly, because I'm sitting in an African program, Fox on Africa, I would like to congratulate um, the Prime Minister-elect uh, on behalf of the African community here in the UK. And actually, uh, the election was surprising, as you said, and for Africa, uh, there's a window of, of cooperation and strengthening the bilateral relations of African countries. The UK is now ready to engage with Africa in a different tone. And I think African politicians do have the opportunity right now to either individually or as a continent-wide deal with the UK as a rich country who wants to deal with them globally, trade-wise. The idea, I think, um, the last um, engagement we as a community in the UK, the diaspora African community in the UK had with the Foreign Office says now they shifted the idea of uh, discussing Africans with an um, aid distribution and they shifted their focus now how to work with Africa and that's what the foreign office dimension now mm. when it comes to Africa so I think it will be very good idea if African politicians grab this opportunity mm. and approach UK as a country who is open for trade now who is open for investment, invest in Africa, and to trade with, rather than talking and discussing with the UK with the aid, money, and all that. All right, let me step in here and ask about the, the communities, the diaspora community. Um, what are the issues that are affecting you, and do you think this government will be able to deal with them? Well, 
and the election campaign when we were talking to the community in different level on now I'm talking to uh, talking as an African man and what they worried is mostly what people are saying about the NHS because majority of African people living here their income scale is not that high therefore the idea that an um, NHS will be privatized is actually disturbing to them and after all Prime Minister of the UK is our Prime Minister the community are worried about the energies, housing, the austerity, all these things that a lot of people are actually worried these mm -hmm. days. But and, and as the diaspora, as the diaspora, we are here to stay and we are here to accept any prime minister this country has. All right. Uh, there, there are problems. All right. Abdi Musa, thank you very much indeed thank for you. taking time to take tours in on Focus on Africa. Thank you. This is Focus on Africa from BBC World News. Is still to come. What benefits does the Africa Basketball League being planned by the NBA bring to the continent? We hear from the man tasked with setting it up. I'm Sophie Ikenye and you're watching Focus on Africa from BBC World News. The top stories on this program. Algeria's new president says he will start consultations for a new constitution that will be put to a referendum as thousands took to the streets in protest. African leaders have taken to social media to congratulate Boris Johnson on his election victory in Britain. Now in South Africa, the government has issued more than a thousand diamond mining permits to artisanal miners who had been working illegally. It's estimated that 14,000 work in the industry without the proper paperwork. Illegal mining reportedly costs the economy about 550 million US dollars a year. The miners are predominantly from Lesotho, Swaziland, Malawi, Zimbabwe and Mozambique. Nomsa Maseko sent this report from the city of Kimberley, known as the diamond capital of South Africa. Hoping to strike it rich, sifting through layers of gravel, the artisanal miners are hard at work. This is part of a disused mine dump and there are still diamonds to be found. Hundreds moved into this area after the government issued permits to small-scale miners. In a landmark deal, 600 hectares were handed over by the government for artisanal mining. Just a few months ago, this work was unlawful and dangerous. There were frequent clashes between illegal miners, police and mine security. It was not easy to get a permit. It was bloodshed, sleepless night, put on the, uh, on the hit list of the mines, going to jail. Yeah, we, we were also declared terrorists by our own government. Despite the risks, South Africa's sky-high unemployment made illegal mining a lucrative option and it attracted people from all walks of life. But this has now changed. A pastor on Sunday, a miner on Monday, Paseka Maloi has been working the soil for five years. So today our lives have, have changed tremendously because we, 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 we are operating legal and uh, we can handle diamonds and we can even sell our diamonds in a tender board. We're feeling very lucky here in Mr. Malloy's camp. We've just found three green rubies, one red ruby and a crystal. This is a good sign. It means that this soil that we are working on, that's where we could find the diamond. Like many others, 77-year-old Clara Maite was arrested several times for illegally mining precious stones. She has to maintain her nine grandchildren and until now had no choice but to work illegally. Our industry has been formalized and that means no South African should ever go hungry. Youngsters must roll up their sleeves and work for their money because the earth and its minerals belong to us. The new permit system has restored the dignity of artisanal miners and that means they no longer have to risk their lives to put food on the table. 
The government hopes that this could now become a blueprint for other mining sectors in the country, potentially manganese, gold and chrome, something that many current illegal miners will probably welcome. Nomsa Masego, BBC News, Kimberley. You're watching BBC Focus in Africa. Time now for some sport. Peter. Many thanks, Sophie. And Springboks captain Sia Colisi says he wants to avoid the pitfalls of fame and fortune and offer inspiration to people instead. Colisi, you might remember, led South Africa to Rugby World Cup glory at the beginning of last month. Colisi was speaking in Monaco on Thursday where he collected a Champion of Peace award. I'm happy that I can inspire people and I will never take that for granted. I'm just trying to do... The, the, the stuff that I dream about doing and, the, and try to use the good that's in my heart and use the people around me. So I just focus on, on, on my core values and, and goals and that's what I want to do, carry out. So I don't think too much about everything else because the more that you start seeing yourself with this amazing hero and our amazing person and I think that's when you stumble over your feet. Now here in England, table toppers Liverpool host Watford in the Premier League on Saturday. It's a match that pitches two Senegal internationals against each other. Liverpool's Sadio Mane comes up against Watford's summer, uh, record summer signing Ismaila Saar. Saar regards Mane as his idol and the best player in the world at the moment. But he says all that will be put aside in the fight for three points. I think the match will be like any other. We are going to work. That's it. We are going there to fight. We are not going there just to watch Sergio play. We also have to play. We are not going to just watch him play. That's it. This is normal. I have to show that I understood the advice I was given by him. That's it. At the end of the match, he can give me some more tips. Let's talk basketball now and bring you the second part of our interview with Amadou Galoufal. He's been charged with setting up the Africa Basketball League, which is scheduled to tip off next March. Twelve teams from seven countries will compete in two conferences with the final holding in Rwanda. Here he talks about the benefits an African league will bring to the sport on the continent. Uh, there's a global teenager today in the world, whether they're from Africa or Latin America or Asia, they generally listen to the same types of music, they're interested in the same technological trend and the same fashion. Our players are great, great trendsetters in all those areas. And Nigerian music being blasted in NBA arenas you know, nowadays and, and other venues really. So I think we want to focus on, on, on that cultural um, you know, expansion. When you get players performing or playing, competing right here on the continent, and having an opportunity to get together and train his national team rather than just bringing, you know, 15 uh, guys uh, a month before a tournament to have a training camp and go play. I think the whole notion of club sports everywhere in the world is the major uh, contributor to national team level and on competitivity and this league is also going to attract world-class players you know because we're going to create the, uh, the conditions you know uh, where players are going can come and make a living and and play uh, uh, on in a world-class environment with the quality of everything around the game and Sophie, i'm sure you're looking forward to the africa basketball league I am indeed, Peter. I am. <laughs> Thanks for the support. <laughs> Thanks. Now, while we've been on air, Algeria's new president has said he will start consultations for a new constitution that will be put to a referendum. Uh, there have been months of protests against the legitimacy of the presidential elections, which eventually took place on Thursday. And that's Focus on Africa for now. I'm Sophie Ikenya. Thanks for your company. Bye.